Hey, this is Derek, and listen to Skepticality, the official audio program of Skeptic Magazine, for Tuesday, March 27th, 2012. I think on a personal level, science... What makes science so fascinating is that you can never know everything. And so there's always something else around the corner to learn. I mean, even if, theoretically speaking, one person could have all of the knowledge that we currently possess about the world, about the universe, there's still so much out there we don't understand. And so it's just mind-boggling in that way. But at the same time, it's wonderful because it means that no matter how much you spend... No matter how much time you devote to learning and no matter how much, you know, general effort you put in to understanding the world, you will never completely understand it. And that is good because it means there's always something to look forward to, always something else around the corner to find out about. And I think that, the fact that science is never-ending, is why it's so beautiful. Once again, this is Derek Colangelo bringing you some of the news and interviews with skeptics and science and people from all walks of life for the promotion of critical thinking and science. Okay, so to start out this episode, we had Ian Goodall explaining the beauty of science in his own words. And then we had a great science shout out by Ross Webster, who gave us his excitement for science. We love it when folks send in their love of science in audio form. If you'd like to do the same, just send in your audio file to us at host at skepticality.com in any standard digital audio format. And we will try to share it with the world. I say it far too often, but this time I actually mean it. We have a pretty fun and packed episode this time around. So let's get right to it. In our usual kickoff fashion, I give you Tim Farley with, well, actually something a little different this time around. Hi, this is Tim Farley of whatstheharm.net and skeptools.com. I've been doing this segment for two years now, and I think it's time to mix it up a bit. Starting this episode, in addition to telling you about skeptic history, I'm also going to try to take a look forward as well and talk about the future of skepticism. I'm calling it Skepticism Past and Future. This week in the past, we've got the original Skeptic Conference, and the anniversary of a Skeptic Outreach website. In the future, we have three new online tools called Lanyard, Hypothesis, and Rebutter. Skeptics love their conferences. There are several each year. Did you know that one of the major U.S. national skeptic organizations was actually created at a conference? Reacting to the spread of New Age pseudoscience and anti-science beliefs, during the 1970s, the American Humanist Association sponsored a meeting led by 25 scientists and called the New Irrationalism, Anti-Science and Pseudoscience. It began on April 30th, 1976, and during that meeting, a group called the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry of Claims of the Paranormal, or PSYCOP, was created to investigate and challenge irrational claims. That group later shortened its name to the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and is still around today. It's the future now and skeptic conferences are still going strong. In fact, there are more of them than ever. It can be daunting keeping track of which one is where, who is attending, who is speaking, and so on. Last Saturday, I blogged about a new tool that could be well suited toward this task, particularly for skeptics who also use Twitter. London-based Lanyard, L-A-N-Y-R-D, bills itself as the social conference directory and ties speakers and attendees to a rich database of event information via their Twitter accounts. The service is free and all the data is crowdsourced, meaning anyone can edit or update information about an event. This might sound like a recipe for anarchy, but 
works surprisingly well, and it opens up all sorts of collaboration opportunities. To jumpstart the use of this service by skeptics for 2012 conferences, I've created event pages for all of the upcoming U.S. conferences this year that didn't already have them. Links to them are in the show notes. Now, skeptics have had a long history of creating websites to communicate. I've done it myself with What's the Harm? One such website celebrates its third birthday this week. The Jenny McCarthy Body Count was launched on March 28, 2009, and chronicles the rise in vaccine-preventable illnesses in the United States since that celebrity made notable anti-vaccine statements back in 2007. It is one of many such single-purpose skeptic websites that I think serve a valuable purpose. But one downside of creating your own website is the ongoing task of encouraging people to visit it. As a result, many skeptic websites end up preaching to the choir. How can we get people to read skeptical analyses more readily without having to lure them to a skeptical website first? Several projects have emerged recently to try to solve this problem. One is a nonprofit called Hypothesis that was launched through a Kickstarter last fall. Hypothesis aims to build an annotation layer for the web. It will allow subject matter experts to fact check or peer review material posted on websites at a sentence by sentence level. By loading a web browser extension, anyone can view these fact checks right as they are viewing the original website. The software is just being developed now, but the plan is to release it later this year and release the code driving it as open source. Another effort emerged more recently out of Sydney, Australia, called Rebutter, R-B-U-T-R. This tool allows page-level linking between articles and rebuttals, but it works in a similar way. You load an extension into your web browser, and then with a click of a button, you can jump from a page full of inf misinformation directly to a skeptical website that explains why it is wrong. Rebutter is in beta now. These are just two of several such online tools that are being developed. I'll talk about others in future editions. But I think skeptics who are online would do well to pay close attention to these projects as they may be very important to our efforts online. And so ends this first edition of Skepticism, Past and Future. I hope you like the new concept. Links to additional material are in the show notes. And follow me on Twitter or Facebook under the name Krelnik, K-R-E-L-N-I-K, for a daily fact from skepticism's past and ongoing news of skepticism's future. We here at Skepticality touted the book The Skeptic's Dictionary several times in the past, and have even had the author, Bob Carroll, on as a guest. So when Swoopy had the brilliant idea to get more people involved and exposed to the important work that Bob does, who was I to argue? What came out of that great idea is our new segment, I Bring You a Natural Virtue, with Bob Carroll. <laughs> Welcome to the first episode of Unnatural Virtue. This is Bob Carroll, creator of the Skeptic's Dictionary and the blog Unnatural Acts. In this and future episodes, I'll be offering some brief comments on topics in critical thinking, skepticism, and science. Today's topic is intuition. We live in a world where intuition is valued more than reflective thinking. This should not surprise us. Our brains are hardwired to make quick judgments. We rely on intuition and unconscious brain processes to get us through the day. Most of the time, our natural way of thinking and perceiving works well enough. Our brain continually tricks and deceives us. Intuition tells us that the mind presents the world as it is. Science and logic tell us otherwise. But we get through most days just fine without reflecting on the fact that the brain constructs the world we perceive and constructs a self in the body as a perceiver of the world. The mind doesn't construct the world out of nothing. 
but neither is the mind working like a video or any other kind of recorder. Our intuitions about the self and the world are to some degree illusions. We're prone to make hasty judgments from personal experience. It takes a lot of reprogramming to overcome our natural instinctive way of making judgments. We call this reprogramming education and learning. Our brains have evolved to see patterns and make connections without giving it a second thought. It's not natural to mistrust our brain, so it is understandable that we're prone to making erroneous causal connections. Science, critical thinking, and skepticism require second, third, and fourth thoughts. They don't come naturally. If they did, it would not have taken so long for science to mature, and there would not be so many people resistant to science. Overcoming the urge to trust personal experience and intuition over scientific studies requires training and skill. Nobody is born with an instinct to perform double-blind controlled studies. Critical thinking requires a disposition to favor empirical evidence, facts, and logical arguments over feelings, hunches, intuitions, and emotions. Many people do not appreciate critical thinking. In fact, they consider it inferior to emotions and intuitions. The critical thinker doesn't ignore hunches and intuitions because often they are the result of unconscious processes based on knowledge, experience, practice, training, and facts. But some people have little interest in the facts unless they support their beliefs. They make important decisions based on gut feelings and have little interest in discussion and argument. Unfortunately, sometimes such people rise to positions of power and influence. We've recently had a president here in the United States, George W. Bush, who openly admitted that he follows his gut when making important decisions, including presumably the decision to send men and women to war. Oprah Winfrey, one of the most influential persons of all time, repeatedly gave a bully pulpit on her television program to promoters of intuition backed by anecdotes. She rarely gave similar exposure to anyone defending reflection and scientific studies. Since our natural inclination is to go with gut feelings and intuitions, we don't really need to cultivate this tendency. What we need to cultivate is skepticism about the reliability of our instincts. Questioning our instincts, gut feelings, first impressions, and what the majority of people around us believe doesn't come naturally. In future episodes, I'll review some cognitive biases and illusions, as well as a few logical fallacies that can lead us astray. I'll go over some ways that scientists and philosophers have developed for keeping our instincts and intuitions in check. In the meantime, please commit some unnatural acts in public. And don't forget, skepticism, though unnatural, is a virtue. Thank you so much, Bob, for contributing your ideas and work on skepticality. I'm sure everyone will be waiting anxiously for the next update. Later on, I get to talk to one of our favorite people, the amazing astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. But before that, I give you some more fun new stuff. A couple weeks back, a few people made mention that the skeptical blogger known as Bug Girl should be on skepticality. So I reach out to her. What came out of it was something fun and interactive that any of our listeners with a Twitter account can participate in. So let me let you hear what I mean. I'm here on the line with, with Bug Girl. Hey. I don't think that's your real name. No. No. That's it's uh mostly. You, mostly. You, 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 so you, you officially named you you renamed yourself Bug Girl? Uh, I I actually have been uh I've actually published under that name. Really? Um that's how seriously I take my pseudonym. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh so so do you want the story of why I'm anonymous? So I... <laughs> Well, yeah, why don't you start with uh, giving us an idea of like what your main focus is and the things you write about. Oh, okay. Um, well, I am an entomologist by training, and I 
these days, I honestly, I do more evil administering than I do entomology, unfortunately. Uh, but I try really hard to write about insects and why they're interesting and also uh, to kind of do a little fact checking on a lot of the uh, insect stories that you see in the news, since very often they're way overblown. <laughs> so things like when people think like all the bees in the world are going to die? Yes, although sometimes I find really fun stuff too. So the there was a really interesting uh, person for a while that was claiming that we had just misinterpreted revelations and the bees were being raptured. Oh, so bees have souls. Apparently so. Well, there you go. That explains everything. Um, so, so you get to meet some really interesting people on the internet. <laughs> I, find, um, uh, I find a lot of interesting people outside the internet as well. <laughs> well, I don't go outside. So. Oh, okay. Well, there you yeah. go. It, except with insects. So. Okay. They, they, they go outside for you? Yes. <laughs> so how did you get down this path of being involved with the insects? And then where, when did you realize that there's this kind of skeptical angle to, like, bugs? Because that's something that most people would never think about. Sure. Um, well, I have... I've always been interested in critical thinking, and I have have been more of a teacher than a researcher for most of my career as a faculty member. And I actually um, started teaching a course, oh, I hate to say the date, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, I actually got um, a grant to bring James Randi to come in and talk to my course, which was really awesome. Uh, and he basically talked to them about critical thinking and how to be skeptical. Um, and from that, I went to uh, one of the amazing meetings, and then I met Rebecca Watson. And Rebecca said, hey, I got the skeptic thing. You want to be a skeptic? And I said, sure. And then it was pretty much all down from there. Yeah. So where do you, <laughs> <laughs> where do you teach? Uh, I can't tell you that. You can't so, tell me. Right. So this is why, I mean, I initially, um, I used to work for the state of Michigan, and Michigan has a lobbying law that basically says if you are responsible for a certain proportion of the budget, um, or if you are able to make policy decisions, you are not allowed to have an opinion publicly um, <laughs> outside your official capacity. Um, because that would be seen as lobbying. Oh. Um, so, so anybody who's ever looked at my blog knows that I do have opinions. I have a lot of opinions. Uh, and so Bug Girl kind of was born out of that uh, and uh, is a way for me to be able to, to say, oh, wow, that, that thing about you know, using bounce dryer sheets and, and putting them in your shirts to repel mosquitoes, that's bullshit. <laughs> I see. And... I I don't know so, what I don't know what political stance uh, dryer sheets might be, but you know they I guess are being overly you cautious. Yeah, the dryer sheet lobby is more oh, powerful than you I know. See. I understand. I got it now. <laughs> um, and so now I'm in. Uh, I have a new job, and uh, I'm at a different university. But they're also. Um, I've been su just successful enough that it would be kind of a major problem if I revealed that I was a. A blue woman on the internet that used the f bomb a lot. Uh, oh. Well, you could just say you're um, trying out for the next uh, Star Trek movie. Yeah, I did. Yeah, when I'm in the provost office, let's put it that <laughs> way. And so that's. Uh, I mean, the provost is like the CEO of a university, and yeah. and they're kind of they're they they're pretty uptight. Basically, they're really uptight. They're really uptight. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that just, you know, debunks the whole mythos about, you know, everybody in college is just these liberal whack jobs that are just smoking pot all the time. <laughs> no, that's the faculty. Sorry, oh, that's not oh. the administrators. <laughs> I, I get it now. I get it now. And that, that comment alone right there, man, I'm out, out on a rail. Going to be okay. Anyway, <laughs> I'll get letters. <laughs> I ended up having you come on the show because a couple of people told me I should have you on. And the first reaction I had was like, but what is she going to talk about bugs that are skeptical? And then, of course, we already like figured that out by your most recent comments on this interview. But 
then came to another idea that, you know, we kind of formed. And then you can tell people a little bit about, about that. Oh, sure. Uh, it's, it's called Dear Bug Girl. Uh, and it grew out of actually a monologue that I did and uh, some of the experiences that I've had uh, where I actually have had to uh, put, put special instructions on my blog about things that I won't respond to if you email them to me um, because a surprising number of people want to send me photos of things that they have pooped out um, or that they found crawling in random bodily orifices and think that I should know what they are and send me many, many pictures of them. Uh, and so the sort of dear bug girl meme got started. Uh, and then I think you guys thought it would be fun to have people email me questions that I could try and answer uh, and, uh, using the hashtag dear bug girl. Uh, and that's mainly because if you're if you're willing to post it on Twitter, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be anywhere near as gross as the stuff that I have already seen. You know, you never know with like, you know, Bitly and all those uh, URL <laughs> shorteners, you have an idea. At least then it will be shared pain with everyone else. <laughs> I think that I think Twitter does that quite a bit, though. It's good at that. Yes. <laughs> so. So what, then, then they can ask you questions like, you know, why does my praying mantis pray and what deity does he pray, pray to? Well, that's the whole very thorny question of is it praying P-R-A-Y or is it P-R-E-Y? Oh. And, and that actually is, if you want to start an argument with, a, with an entomologist, that's a really good place to start. Yeah, of course, I had to d step into that one because I thought it was funny. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you, you had no idea. You know, you just open a huge can of worms. See, um, I, I, I say it's the second one, but, you know, I've seen them eat, so. I, I, I honestly don't know where I come down on that. I tend to be, um, in terms of things like that, I tend to be more of an accommodationist. It's like, you know, <laughs> you can spell it however you want, as long as we get along. It's okay. <laughs> Well, well, Just as long as you don't try and force your spelling on me, it's all good. <laughs> well, so what's the official name for the praying mantis? Manis? It is, um, you know, honestly, I don't. I would have to look it up. Oh. And there are official common names for all insects. So, the Entomological Society of America has a book um, that is is updated yearly, and it is all the official uh, common names for oh, insects. I see. What so, is what do they then? Which way do they spell praying mantis? I, you know, I don't have my book. See, I'm Next asking Bug Girl, and she doesn't know. I, I didn't know you were going to ask me that one. If I, <laughs> I need, didn't think I was going to need all my reference materials, so I'll be more prepared next time. <laughs> well, that'll be like the first question somebody asks you then. Yeah. Well, obviously, we have our first question right there. I see. So, how or will people get you these questions? If you tweet at me um, and it's bug underscore girl on Twitter and use the hashtag dear bug girl and then you can ask you whatever you can fit into 140 characters pretty much yeah or any link, ex link can... extending <laughs> service they use yes where can people find more about you and the stuff you write about either on your blog or about insects or about um, your pic pictures about bugs you've taken or whatever? <laughs> the, the blog is a good place to start. Um, and that's actually linked from my Twitter feed um, or it's at membrasa.wordpress.com. Now, are you still blog for Skeptic as well? I, I am still a Skeptic, but I'm, t I'm actually on medical leave right now. Oh, um, you and hurt your fingers. It, Kind of. It's actually more my brain. Oh, uh, well, I, I, I've, I have that same problem. <laughs> uh, and uh, so so I'm kind of taking a little bit of a break, mostly until I get some other things sorted out. But I'll be back. Very I'll cool. be back, and I will be at, at Skeptic Con in July in Minnesota. Oh, cool. I used to be up there anyway, according to what you said earlier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love yeah. Minnesota, yeah. <laughs> I could tell with the voice. Go get some hot dish. It'll be awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you so much. And now people should, you know, get on Twitter and try to hashtag you some questions about 
insects or anything else that they think appropriate. Yes, and we will find out if this, if it was really, really a good idea or a bad idea that I let myself be talked into this. Yeah, we'll see if it works. (laughs) Maybe nobody will like take you up on the offer. Based on things I get emailed to me, I think that's unlikely. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much for joining the uh, the skepticality segment band of of brothers or sisters now. Uh, people. People. Band of people. <laughs> Band of skeptics. <laughs> yes, that works. That works. It works very well. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. From the dictionary to bugs, we now head off to space. Here in the United States, we have had a great run for the past few decades when it comes to launching people off of Earth and into orbit. But now, with the demise of the space shuttle program and the recent fuss over the federal budget and misunderstanding over NASA and the funding of science, it's led our next guest to write his latest book, Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. For long-time listeners to the show, I shouldn't have to describe who Neil deGrasse Tyson is or the work he does. If you don't know who he is, or the work he does, I encourage you to go look up the Hating Planetarium, where he is the director, or possibly one of his fun cameos on television shows like The Big Bang Theory, not to mention his several appearances on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. When I got to read Space Chronicles, I realized just how important the message in the book really is, and was even more excited I got to talk to Neil once again. I haven't seen you for about a year. <laughs> well, it's great to be back. I thought maybe you guys had forgotten all about me. Well, you had to do something like come up with a book. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it takes to get back on skepticality? Not really. You can come on any time. <laughs> I was just, you know. That's I just a high bar, you know. Well, you had the new book come out, and I said, okay, I have to have you back on. Uh-huh. So other than the book, we'll get to that. So what is going on in Neil's life lately? Well... I mean, yeah, the book has preoccupied me of recent months, but I would say overall what I'm highly looking forward to, and I hope others will too, is that I'm hosting the the next generation's version of Carl Sagan's Cosmos. You know, that program was like from 1980. That's an entire generation ago. And it was landmark then, and I still think it's a landmark documentary series. Uh, There's been no documentary like it. And... I don't know why. Is it, is it the writing? Is it the? I mean, maybe it's a little bit of everything. But uh, I've I've partnered with two of the original three creative principals from that original show, and uh, of course Carl isn't with us. But there's Andrean and Steve Soder. They co-wrote Cosmos. We also teamed up with a, a very good producer, Mitch Kennold. and so we're taking this. And in fact, it's going to air, scheduled to air on Fox. And that, that got a lot of reaction from people. Uh, my favorite reaction was, what, they're all a bunch of nitwits on Fox. What are you bringing Cosmos <laughs> to Fox? And I said, that's why we're bringing Cosmos to Fox. Well, also people forget that, you know, Fox, the TV station network, is not the same people that run, like, the other Fox stuff that people associate with the Fox name. Exactly. You know, Fox News is a separate entity. I mean, obviously, it's under the same News Corp umbrella, but the management and editorial policies of Fox News are not the same as Fox Network. And there's also 20th Century Fox. That's what brought us Avatar. There is Fox Light Pictures, which brought us, that's the indie arm of of 20th Century Fox. And that's what brought us uh, Slumdog Millionaire and and Little Miss Sunshine and, and, uh, you know, other sort of critically acclaimed indie films. And so Fox is a is a is quite a broad portfolio. It also has The Simpsons. I mean you can't get more sort of leftist than that. <laughs> well and, also it also has things like they had Battle Battlestar Galactica for a little while and they oh, had Oh I'd forgotten that. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Yeah. yeah. And they had uh, Eureka. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, their dramas, uh, be they sci fi sci fi or otherwise, are actually quite 
reg highly regarded, including of, of recent times, uh, I was thinking, uh, Fringe. I've seen a few episodes of Fringe. It's fascinating uh, sort of creative storytelling. And, of course, Fox also has some of the highest rated shows on television, including American Idol. They have Glee. And uh, so uh, I think a more balanced uh, perspective is in order when people are quick to judge the value of something airing on one network versus another. Well, that they also have things like Bones. Yes, Bones and and House. Yeah. One. Yeah. These are these are great shows. Well written, well acted, and so, yeah. Where are you on the Cosmos filming schedule? Yeah. So we're right now still scripting, and that got a little delayed. We had hoped to premiere in early next year, but that won't happen now. It's delayed. At, at least six months, possibly a full year. And so I, I think realistically we're looking at February 2014. Mm. And uh, time slot's not established yet, but it will likely be, be prime time. So this will be prime time on a major network, which even if it fails, will draw up likely ten times the audience of, of uh, what it would have gotten had it uh, premiered on PBS. Yeah, possibly. Although things lately with things like the, uh, uh, what is it, the, oh, what's that TV show that everybody loves that's on PBS now that everybody flocks to? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I've seen a lot of chatter about that in the blogosphere. I yeah. forgot the name of it. But, yes, they, they, PBS is not without the capacity to have a very popular show. Uh, but I think what happens is you get people who where PBS is not in their sort of their their speed remote button, right? It, they'll just skip right past it. And if we only ever attract people who know that PBS, who already know that PBS has higher brow content, then it's not targeting, I think, the people who need the messages the most, uh, pure and simple. And a big, uh, one of the people who sort of brokered our access to Fox was Seth MacFarlane, the creator of Family Guy and many other T television uh, programs and he uh, so people got all worried well is Stewie going to show up in one of the episodes of Star Trek? <laughs> you know, so again people they're only ever thinking the worst and I always find that curious they're more likely to want to think the worst than to want to think the best and uh, so Seth is a he's a big fan of Cosmos he's a, a fan of my work and he cares about integrity he cares about content and uh, he wants to make a difference in the world. And so his energy and investment in this project is uh, will bring that about. That kind of brings us to this book because it really does do take us through a journey of our time getting to and through space to our current day. Yeah, so, yeah the book is, is actually every thought I've ever had about our past, present, and future in space. This is Space Chronicles, uh, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. And it's every thought I've ever had. And I thought, I've got to collect this together into one volume and share it with the public. And it seems to have come out at a at an opportune time because uh, Newt Gingras had just commented that he wanted a moon colony and wanted to annex it as a 51st state. <laughs> it was an entertaining comment, but I think uh, some people took it a little more seriously than he had intended it. But... The fact is it brought space back into the, the world of concern and so it made it a, a, a legitimate topic for editorials. And then, then the book comes out and the opening chapter of the book is called Space Politics. And this then jumps the jump species now because normally books like this are written by space enthusiasts and read by space enthusiasts. And now there are people, there are economists who are interested in it. In fact, later today, being interviewed on uh, Fox Business News, and Bloomberg Business News was interested. And so they're recognizing that space is not simply just a thing that space enthusiasts do that they think is cool, that space is a fundamental driver of innovation and of our economy. And at a time when our economy could use a boost, uh, I think space has become a more real topic. Now, I'm, I heard that you mentioned that this book originally had a far different title. Oh, yeah. 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 The, I submitted the book with the title, Failure to Launch, The Dreams and Delusions of Space Enthusiasts. There's a big part of the book where I just 
I, I was just astonished. I mean, I, I, I understood what I was seeing, but I was nonetheless astonished that it prevailed. The, 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 the delusional understanding that so many space enthusiasts have about our place in space. They'll say things like, oh, the reason why we're not on Mars by now is because we don't have the charismatic leaders like Kennedy was back in, Kennedy and others were back in the 1960s, or we don't have the right stuff the way we had it back then, or we're not risk takers the way we were back then. And there's, there's this back and forth comparison, and, it, it, and these comments are completely devoid of any historical context, any political awareness, any geopolitical awareness, uh, social, uh, uh, social fabric awareness, everything that actually drives the nations of decisions are, are ignored or forgotten or overlooked when people lament that we're not farther in space than they felt we should be. Hence the name failure to launch. <laughs> yeah, failure to launch. And I'll give you just a quick example. People were not even accurately in touch with their own emotions during the last shuttle launch that ended the program of Shuttle Atlantis. Uh, I was active in the Twitterverse during that launch and landing. And there were people saying that they were shedding a tear. They were kind of misty-eyed over the end of the shuttle program. And I accused them of not knowing why they were actually crying. I said, no, that's not why you're crying. <laughs> you're not crying because the shuttle is ending. You're actually crying because there's not another ship waiting on an adjacent launch pad to continue this adventure because nobody shed a tear at the end of the Gemini program because the mighty Saturn V was sitting adjacent, you know, a few miles away on another launch pad ready to go. And so, so that's one very small piece of the many, uh, uh, the many sort of uh, delusional corrections I'm offering the community. Uh, an another one is that we went to the moon because we're Americans and we're explorers and it's in our DNA and that's what we do and we're discoverers and we, we were just simply at war. Let's just be completely <laughs> clear about that. And when we stopped going to the moon on learning that Russia was not really headed there, then, then it's obvious why we stopped because Russia wasn't headed there and they were our sworn enemy. And to say oh, we needed leaders then to continue on to Mars. No, this is just false. It's a false understanding of the actual drivers of historical decisions. So there's a lot of indictment of that kind of thinking in this book. And by the way, I've presented these ideas to space enthusiast audiences, and it's been very warmly received, ending in standing ovations. So I didn't make enemies writing this book. I think I, I what I did was I gave people a recipe to understand the true a recipe of action to understand the true causes and effects of, of decisions that peoples and nations make. So that if you actually want to go to space, you might be able to, to, to match your decisions to, to, to consequences, to the consequences that you seek, rather than just shooting in the dark, which is what, in fact, everybody was doing. So does this mean that you're hoping that you hear in a, a rumor from the CIA that they found out that... China is going to Mars within the next 10 years? <laughs> yeah, so the rumor is not a CIA rumor. I, I joked about uh, let's, let's convince the, the leaders of China to leak a memo. It doesn't even have to be true. <laughs> just, just invent a memo that says they want to put military bases on Mars. And we'll be, we'll be on Mars in two years, easily. <laughs> None of the sometime in the 2030s, maybe... You know, by a president to be named later on a budget to be later determined. You know, I, uh, so yeah, war gets you there for sure. It got us to the moon in the 60s. But I don't want to go into space for war reasons. That, that's not a good reason. Uh, there are other reasons. You know, the, money is a good reason. You can make money, uh, not simply by going into space, because that's probably long into the future before that, become, that itself becomes a, 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 a marketable entity to the, to, the, to the capital markets, but a sellable entity to the capital markets. What happens is the need to innovate, to do something more tomorrow than you did today, is what drives invention. And when you drive invention, you drive new economies. It's that simple. And you can, there'll be the direct ones that come straight out of the space program. But if you do it in a big way, 
then it influences the entire national culture. And then we have a culture of innovation. And right now, we are so not a culture of innovation. We're a culture of let's wait till a problem comes and then find a Band-Aid to put on it. When you innovate, you're out in front of all problems. And in fact, there are problems that never arise because you circumvented them in the first place for having clever solutions to, um, like, for example, it's been said the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, right? People innovated the way out of that state of, of, of culture. No, we still have stones. <laughs> so the budget for NASA comes to somewhere under a penny per capita? Yeah, uh, per, uh, per, on every dollar of your, uh, every tax dollar that you pay. It's, a, it's about, it's a little bit less than a penny. That's right. Yeah, and yet people still continue to call NASA a terrible pork project. Which... Yeah, so, so for, first let me comment on pork. Uh, there's pork everywhere, all right? I mean, this is kind of, it is, it is what Congress likes to decry, but in the end, so many of them benefit from it in their districts and it brings jobs that, the, from what I can tell, the decrying of pork is, is posturing because when money actually gets distributed because you make your case that your district needs it compared with somebody else's, uh, then people are happy. All right, so given that fact, okay, Given, you know, consider, for example, that the, you know, why is it that we launch spacecraft out of Florida, but, but mission control during the mission is in Houston? Well, okay, you know, Lyndon Johnson was from Houston, okay? <laughs> he was from Texas. And, you know, Texas has a huge lobby in all of this. And so, you know, there's politics all throughout. And so I'm not even going to be so naive as to say, let's get politics out of, no, no, there's always politics. Um, and I don't even have a problem with that. What you want is, w whether or not it's pork, what you want is for there to be a mission statement, which, when it is completed, benefits the entire country. And the difference between NASA, if we find pork in it or not, but let's assume there is, NASA pork and other pork, is that other pork never leaves the district in which it was given. Typically, pork is, oh, I need money in my district so that I can make a... Uh, a, uh, I don't know, a power plant or a bridge. A bridge. Yeah, a bridge. Okay, all right. D do I benefit from a bridge in Alaska? I don't think so, all right? But do I benefit from the innovations that NASA brings to bear on the frontier of science and engineering? You bet. You, you bet. You bet. And so, so there's, so, so add a half a penny on a dollar, if, well, that's not enough to go to Mars and beyond. So you have to Increase that. So I just suggest double it. Nice round penny. That's Woo. easy. Hold up a penny. That's what it is on your tax doll. I can do that. I can do that. And well, that'll be enough to go to Mars in a big way. Send astronauts to Mars or to asteroids or to back to the moon, moon colonies. It'll the, uh, explore the far side of the moon and put telescopes there and find places in space where the forces of gravity and the centrifugal forces balance and in those spots, they're called Lagrangian points. You can build huge structures that are not um, that are stable, that are not uh, stressed by the tugging of one gravitational field or another. And they don't. So, and they don't require any form of energy to keep them stable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Very small amounts of energy. There's a there's a slight drift in their location, but it's very, very small. And very small fuel tanks can keep the thing there for hundreds of years. So. Uh, so that's part of the advantage of these spots. So I want to see space as our backyard, where there might be a scientific reason to go to one destination, a geopolitical reason to go another, a touristic reason to go to a third. There might be a security reason to, uh, to occupy one other spot, or an asteroid is headed our way. That's, I'd call that a security problem, <laughs> and I'd want to sort of be able to deflect that. Uh -huh. So I don't want to be destination-driven. I want just the whole frontier to be open, and everyone will see that that's the frontier, and everyone will feel what it means to explore once again. I want something like Hubble on the dark side of the moon. <laughs> the far side, that would be. All, all sides of the moon receive light. Well, that's true. You must have been um, 
heavily influenced by Pink Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was a little too young. <laughs> oh yeah, but it was still there. So I'm sure you heard of it. Oh, trust me, all the lasers and things. I guess. Of course, yeah. That was the big laser planetarium show for a long time. Yeah. Dark side of the moon. So you don't do that at your uh, your planetarium? No, no, no. Those, well, because you can buy a laser at the checkout line of Kmart. So <laughs> lasers don't like, lasers don't have the appeal that they did back in the 1970s. <laughs> so I heard, and I've heard you say that you don't like to talk to government officials directly to attempt them to change their minds. You like to tell people to use their power as the electorate. Um, so what should we all do to like do that? ourselves. Yeah, so just to clarify that, you know, there's always the urge write to your congressman to tell them what you want them to do. And I you know, I just was never comfortable doing that because you know, members of Congress represent, I mean, what, 800,000, a million people that's in the in the in 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 the House of Representatives and of course senators represent entire states. For me to go in and have a session with one of these representatives and tell them what I want them to do. So uh, as, a, as a scientist and as an educator and as, uh, as someone with a mouthpiece, okay, so the newspapers print my op-eds and I appear on television, I feel that it's much more, it's more commensurate with my duty to enlighten the public, the electorate, so that they can then choose the leaders who they want, who fulfills their needs and expectations. And that's how it really should happen, I think. But me, that being said, after the book came out a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to testify in front of the Senate, the Senate subcommittee on, uh, or is it committee on uh, transportation, commerce, and and science, and they oversee the funding of NASA. And so I think I got the sequence of those three words wrong, but the, those are the categories that concern them. And so there I am speaking to senators, and I I said to myself. You know, I don't even know if they're listening, but if they are, I'm telling them things. If they're already supporters of science, I'm telling them things they already know. Maybe there's some extra nuances they hadn't thought about. But, but I said, where is this going to land? And it turned out the footage of that testimony has somebody posted it on YouTube, and now it's got it's rising up, approaching a couple of hundred thousand views. And I say, well, that's a better place for people to see and hear these comments, not the halls of the Senate. I I. I've seen that that YouTube clip. It's been shared around like all over the internet. Yeah, and what's odd is, you know, I always feel a little stilted when I'm reading from prepared remarks. I'd much rather just stand up in front of a room and just have at it. So, so I'm I was not. I mean, I was a little disappointed in my in my testimony because it didn't have the sort of the animation and the emotion that I. I, I want to put into those words and in those sentences, but I was nonetheless pleased that people were moved by it, or at least by it, uh, based on the the comment threads that followed. And so I'm, I'm happy to recognize that. And I've also posted the actual uh, text, and which is slightly longer than my written uh, than my spoken testimony. Uh, but and so they've both been very warmly received by the public. And now the public is doing things. They're making extra videos. They're writing to their uh, members of Congress. And, and I feel that's, that's, what I, that's what I should do, really. And then I just come back home when it's time <laughs> and play with my kids, you know. So I heard you tell us that we should all give up our dreams of Tyson for president in 2016 or 2020. <laughs> yeah, I got asked that several months back. Yeah. Uh, actually, August, when, uh, after my second appearance on Bill Maher, uh, real time on Bill Maher, which is HBO, which I don't even get HBO. I had to wait for the for them to mail me the DVD. <laughs> but but the uh, after that appearance, people I, uh, the New York Times asked me what I would do if I were president. And they asked the same question of a half dozen other people who are not politicians. I think this was at a time when the the debt ceiling couldn't be agreed upon. And, and I, I said some things in Bill Maher, you know, that's a politically oriented show. And here I am a scientist listening to people, mostly hot air come out from the extremes of the political spectrum. And I try to sort of condense that hot air into liquid and <laughs> try, try to make sense out of what people are saying. And I offered comments that were warmly received by it, certainly the studio audience and based on some other reactions, I think by others as well. But, 
So there I am, and so I said, no, I don't want to be president. If I were president, I would not be president. That, that was my first line. And because it assumes you can just swap out one leader for the next, and then everything will be fine. And, and I, I remembered a lot of this. You know, I'm an academic, and I'm a scientist, and George W. Bush was not particularly favored among academics. And so, and I'm an academic, and I was twice appointed by him to serve in Washington on commissions and on panels, but, well, two commissions and one panel, just three appointments. And I, and there they're saying, they should get the bum out of the office. He's an idiot. He's this, he's that. But, and so, I, and I kept thinking about it, and I said to myself, okay, suppose you manage to remove him from office. There's the matter, the little matter of the 60 million people who voted for him. These are your fellow countrymen, right? So, so you take him out. What do you do about them now? 60 million people voted for him. And who rose, who rose up to popularity after Bush? Well, there was Sarah Palin. And then there are people saying, Sarah Palin, well, she's never led anything. And she's not it. Well, of course, she was governor of Alaska. But Alaska, not, it's a big state, but not a, not a, it doesn't have a high population. So people complained about her. And I said, why are we complaining about the leaders? Let's complain about ourselves. <laughs> that's, that's my point. Right? It's not about the leaders. It's about the, 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 the motivation of the electorate to put someone into office that represents their views. And if they have views that are warped or different or uneducated or overeducated, whatever their views, that's who you're going to get. That's who they're going to put up there. So I said, no, I don't want to. Don't, I don't want to lead anybody. I, I want to enlighten people so that they can think more deeply about problems that they confront, so that they can make their own decisions based on their own cultural, social mores, based on their own values, but at least they'll be educated, informed decisions. So then how about a cabinet position or uh, maybe the head of NASA? No, well, so the head of NASA serves at the pleasure of the president and spends the money that the president hands them. And I think NASA needs twice as much money. And if you're head of NASA, you can't say, I want twice as much money. <laughs> <laughs> you are not allowed to say that. But I'm allowed to say that because I don't report to the president. All right? Everyone else in that command chain, including the science advisor and the cabinet, reports to the president. But I don't report to the president. And in fact, at the end of the day, it is the president who reports to us. I always kept to remind people that they all work for us. That is correct. And as long as I'm not in his command chain, I can say what the hell I want. <laughs> and, and say it, well, in a, I mean, in an, in an informed what the hell I want. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, and people can say what they want, and they can put pressure on lawmakers. And there's a point where they'll, they'll have to listen and they'll have to respond. And so I think I was invited in to testify in front of the Senate because the opening chapter of Space Chronicles was featured as the cover story of Foreign Affairs magazine, which lands in the lap of every single member of Congress every, every two months when it comes out. So, so they had to react. I think if it was just the book, they, I don't think they'd feel compelled to. It's just, oh, just Tyson wrote another book. Oh, Tyson's book is now in Foreign Affairs magazine, read by politicians around the world, and he's saying that NASA is falling behind the world, intellectually, culturally, financially, uh, innovationally, and it forced them to sit up straight, I think. I think that's how that happened. And you couldn't do that if you were president? Right. Or... If I'm head of NASA, you can't write a cover story for Foreign <laughs> Affairs magazine criticizing what the president did, excuse me? No. <laughs> So, since you were the one that killed Pluto, maybe... No, no, no. I, I, I drove the getaway car, okay? <laughs> I was an accessory. I did not, you know, the other folks, uh, colleagues of mine who, 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 who pulled the trigger. But you, see, but you see, then the opposition, if you try to run for president, they would have used that against you. Yeah, they'll dig up stuff. <laughs> Third graders against Tyson. There you go. He, he, yeah. So speaking of Pluto, do you still get fun fan letters from kids and other people about your involvement and all that? No, because when it was hot news, those kids were in third grade, and now they're like in college with other hormonal drivers that <laughs> occupy their, their free time. So no, they're all done. And the next generation of students, you know, the, the current generation of third graders, they're learning the solar system without Pluto 
uh, to begin with. And I recently tweeted, because I tweet at Neil Tyson, N-E-I-L-T-Y-S-O-N, if I can plug my Twitter stream on the podcast, I, I tweeted recently that the uh, there's a Cat in the Hat early reader series, which continues the legacy of of, of Dr. Seuss, uh, but of course Dr. Seuss is dead, right? Whatever his real name is, I forgot. Theodore Geisel, right? So he's dead. Is that his name, Theodore Geisel? I think so. Uh, yeah. So he's dead, but but the spirit of that and the illustrations remain, and so they continue this. And so one of the books is called was first published in 1999. It's called Our Place in Space. And the cat in the hat and thing one and thing two, you may remember them. Those are the creatures who came out of the box the cat in the hat brought to clean up the house in the cat in the hat story. Well, so thing one and thing two and the cat in the hat give you a tour of the solar system. And in 1999, Pluto was the last of the visited sites. And now, in a revised 2009 edition, they don't even go, Pluto is not even listed <laughs> <laughs> they end on Neptune, and they fix the rhymes so that the rhymes end at Neptune. Wow. And so I tweeted this, and I said, if it's good enough for Dr. Seuss, by golly, it ought to be good enough for you. It's space washing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are your thoughts when people say that the federal government should be out of the space business anyway, and all these things should be taken up by the private companies and all that private money? Oh, yeah, so that's an underinformed. That's another delusional, I just add, you know, delusional comment number 37, B, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's delusional about that is uh, the private enterprise can never lead a frontier if that frontier is expensive, dangerous, and with unknown risks, unquantified risk. The, when those three factors are all true for the space frontier, and when you combine them, they, that is an enterprise that cannot be valued in the capital markets because capital markets presume that you're an investor and someone is collecting your investment money and they will say, here's how it will pay back and you'll, I'll pay you back more money than you're giving me now. The frontier of science does not lend itself to that kind of thinking. And so governments are, by the way, in the history of civilization, that has been true. All right? The first entity to cross the Atlantic from Europe was not a private company because they don't know if, is the world going to end the be beasts and demons over the edge of the earth or the or will the trade winds stop and leave you stranded are there hot is it hostile are there nobody knew Queen Isabella was curious King Ferdinand was curious so they fund Columbus Columbus draws the maps. Columbus tells you where the hostile folks are and where the friendly folks are and if there's food and are there wood supplies to rebuild your ships and are there riches there that you can exploit or trade or conquer. This is the information brought back to Europe. And when that information is brought back, then commercial enterprise kicks in. Then rose up the Dutch East India Trading Company. This is, this is a common a common sequence of events that's been going on since there's been any kind of economies at all. So it would require the government to lead the frontier. And then when the risks are assessed and the costs are understood and the dangers are identified, then private enterprise comes in. And right now, uh, no reason why private enterprise couldn't take over low Earth orbit. We've been there, done that. The, all the risks are understood. And there's no reason why NASA has to use their own vehicles to get to and from the space station. Now, since there's so many people who continue to believe otherwise, how do we make them realize just how important all these government programs really are? Because it seems to be an ongoing trend in, in life these days where it's like just have everything be private money. Yeah, so, so the way you do it is uh, I have an idea. You have a podcast that you invite me on to talk about the book. I just did that. <laughs> okay. I'm done. All, of, all the problems are solved. I got, I got an idea. Why don't I write a book that talks about those issues? Uh, so I think we're doing all we can, right? I, you know, I write a book. You, I'm on your podcast. I have a Twitter stream. And, I, you know, you can only do what you can do. And uh, I'm not here. By the way, let me make, be very clear. I don't require that anybody believes anything, all right? I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not physically. I'm not going to lobby 
Congress. I'm not going to pick it. I'm not going to chant. All I'm going to do is tell you, if you do not do this, here is the consequence, as best as my read of the history of human conduct in civilizations throughout the world. So understand the causes and effects of things. If you want to teach religion and religious philosophy in your science classroom, look, we live in an elective free society. If that's what you want to do, and you vote that to happen in your community, I'm not going to stop the vote. But I'm going to tell you the consequence of that. The consequence is the people will not understand what science actually is. And you will disenfranchise them from the frontier of scientific discovery. And you will be crippling America's capacity to compete in the 21st century because innovations in science and technology are the engines of the economies in the 21st century. I utter those sentences and then I walk away. Okay? That's what I do. I don't, I don't pick it. I don't, I'm just saying here's the causes and effects of things. Now, if you have a if you, if you have a different outlook, on, maybe you say I'm wrong. Maybe I misread the trajectory of history. I'm open to hear that. But I've thought long and hard about this and written about it and vetted it. And I think, it, I think, I think I'm getting it right. And so uh, just be, be, just be self-aware. So you're not, you're just the warning bell. You're not like the guy. That's a, uh, thank you. That's a simpler way to say it. I'm, 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 I, I'm ringing a bell to wake you up. Hey. And to offer you some perspective and enlightenment. And after that, I don't know what to do. Wow. It gives me, you know, sadness and hope all at the same time. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's, a dual, it's a dual feeling, and, and I agree with you. And based on the threads of some of the semi-viral YouTube videos of me talking about NASA, uh, looking at people's threads, they say, I can't believe we're so behind, but this offers so much hope. You know, so there's a lot of that going on, and I think that's a... Maybe that, that's the ideal combination of emotion because the depth of the problem motivates you that much more to reach for the solution. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I buy that. Yeah. So over your past few books, there seems to be a trend where you have a book that's more of a hard astrology or you know space book and then one like Space Chronicles, your current one, which is more directed at a completely general audience. So maybe your next book could be all about experiments and things you, do, things you can do yourself to discover the beauty of the cosmos, especially since we all live in big cities with light, polluted skies. Uh -huh. So here's the thing with me and my books. I try to write a book or say things in public that become books, that assemble the notes and the writings that become books, that others are not in a position to do. And so if I have a point of view or an outlook on the universe that is not common or no one's thought of, I might be more inclined to write about it. But if it's just, here's how to appreciate the night sky, we got people who do that. We got people. That's done. I don't need to do that again. Even if I did it a little better, I say, you know, they left out X, Y, and Z. I can put that in. It might be a little better. I don't need to do that because it's fine. They're, 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 they're fine. And, and there's no shortage of astronomy books on the shelf of the library. You said astrology a moment ago. Did I? Yes, well, you did. Well, you know, Leo's still up there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the astro so that's why I just say astrophysics. No one ever confuses True. that word with astrology. So you go to the books. There are more books on astronomy than there are in any other scientific subject, except perhaps for medicine and, 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 and medical cure, you know, self-help cure books. I was going to say, self-help. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So there, there are more astro books than there are chemistry books for the public. Then there are geology books for the public. Then there are biology books for the public. I blame the, so, I blame the, I blame the pictures. <laughs> so, yeah, picture, we got the best photos going. You know, no, I'm not going to shy away from that claim. So. It might be more, you know, pretty to look at other than, you know, the inside of a person. <laughs> yeah. No. So, but you're not going to make the book because of your new series that's going to come out in a couple of years. You can then create "Love the Cosmos and the Big City." Uh, well, there, uh, there are books. I, forgive me, I've forgotten the author's name. 
thing, uh, Chet Ramo might be one of the authors. Ramo, R A Y M O, Chet, oh, R E Y M O, Chet Ramo. Uh, one of them, I think, is, you know, stargazing from the city, you know, things to look for and to do and what kind of telescope to buy. People have done this. I don't need to step into their arena. And uh, I wanna, I, I'm going to create an arena that no one else has even thought to uh, circumscribe and produce content out of that arena. And this space book is said things that no other space book says. And that's why I put it out there. If I was just thinking all the same thing everybody else was, I wouldn't do it. There's no reason for it. Well, like you said, you wrote this book, and it's something you couldn't do if you actually worked with the government. That's correct. That's correct. So you got the, this is actually an example of what you mean by the reason why you wouldn't do it. That's correct. And the force of the book may, in fact, be greater on NASA than the force of the head of NASA trying to make NASA do what it needs to do. So you also have your uh, podcast. Yes, yes. Thanks for remembering that. It's Star Talk Radio, and I'm host of that show. And my guests are typically not scientists. Uh, every now and then we have a scientist, but the goal is to get pop culture figures hewn from society who, uh, who they could be actors, politicians, comedians. And what I do is explore all the ways that science has influenced that person's life. And so the goal of the show is to show people, is to demonstrate to people that science is all around us. It's not just the purview of scientists themselves. And we have a fun time doing it. And my co host is. Is, is typically a, a, a professional stand-up comedian. So, so as we talk about the science, there's always some kind of quip that uh, makes me laugh. And, uh, and, we, uh, and the show goes by very fast, and it's at just an hour a week. But you can find the, the back, the, the archival shows on uh, startalkradio.net, and it'll take, it'll take you there. We've got some great guests. We've had Morgan Freeman, Whoopi Goldberg, Jon Stewart. Uh, we've had three football players from the New York Giants. It turns out one of them was a, uh, a math whiz when he was in, in, in middle school and took the SATs when he was in seventh grade, and he's a, he was a linebacker for the New York Jets. So there's fun science in the world around us that I think there's not enough occasion or not enough circumstances that people exploit to find the, how deep science can reach into pop culture. And so that's what we try to do. So thanks for remembering that. It's called Star Talk Radio? Star Talk Radio, startalkradio.net is where you'd find us online. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Let us know where you are online and things like that, where you're going to be on any, any TV shows, because you've been on like Big Ben Theory and all that, our, our daily show. Uh, yeah, that was one of the funnest things I have ever did was go to L.A. for 24 hours and, and film my little cameo for the Big Bang Theory. So apparently Big Bang, you know, it's on every day now in syndication, and so... Uh, every couple of weeks, I get a note from someone saying they saw me on the show because they never, the, the show never tells me when I'm going to be on the show. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, that was fun to do. I, I also made a cameo along with, with Bill Nye on an episode of Stargate Atlantis, oh. season five. That was fun. Uh, but basically, those are just cameos. I'm not trying to think of a career. <laughs> I don't know how to act. I'm not a good actor, and and fortunately, because it's a cameo, I'm playing myself. The viewer is a little more forgiving of not of the of the absence of acting talent when it's a cameo, who's not an actor, or at least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> so, so yeah, we're we're actively scripting Cosmos. We're going to production the end of the year. We'll be filming most of 2013, and so no, there's a gap between this and that next project. But I'll be busy. Uh, I'll be you know under brush, uh, preparing for the next the next uh, effort there. So you have your Twitter. Oh, yeah, so I do tweet actively. I mean, no, maybe a, a, a tweet a day, 10 tweets a week, that, it's that kind of number. And it's, uh, I tweet at Neil Tyson. And if you're not a twi Twitter person, uh, I actually have a Facebook page that live streams my tweets. Oh. Okay. So it, in Facebook, if you look for Tyson's tweets, uh, minus, leave out the apostrophe, Tyson's tweets, on Facebook, you'll go to the Facebook page that lists all the tweets, and that and that way you don't have to um, uh, stoop to being a, a, a Twitter user. And the uh, and no, that's a, that's really how I'm uh, reaching the public now. 
and uh, there's a there's a fan page on Facebook, but I didn't create it and I don't maintain it. Uh, my Facebook page is the old fashioned kind, which has a a hard limit at five thousand uh, friends, and so uh, it's it's pe it's pegged at that limit, and so I don't I don't advertise that there's a Facebook page. Yeah. So that that's the kind of things that keep me off the streets. <laughs> And then they can always find you at your day job. Day job. Oh yeah, yeah. So my day job, I, I'm uh, I, I'm director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, and we have programs there and space shows and this sort of thing. And so yeah, yeah, that's, it all keeps me keeps me going. So you can come back on the show anytime. Well, and, thank and, you, Darren. Since you mentioned that you know, you know why it takes so long, I have to like you know tell you to be on now and then more often. <laughs> well, I'm there for you. You you were one of my first podcasts I ever recorded with, and so uh, it's a, a special place in my heart of podcasts. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks for having me. As usual, you can get a copy of Neil's book from our website under the bookstore link. Remember, if you want to send your own audio shout out or proclaim your love of science using your own voice, please send those audio files to us at hosts at skepticality.com. We will try to get them on the show. As always, links to things we talked about in this episode and ways to grab the books you hear about, please head over to our website and check out the notes for this episode at skepticality.com. Hungry for more skepticism? Want to learn the truth about the scientific controversies of our time? Then subscribe to Skeptic, the quarterly magazine Stephen Jay Gould called the best journal in the field. To subscribe, visit skeptic.com today.